this year will mark, this year specifically, September of this year will mark the 10th anniversary of China's Belt and Road Initiative, where Xi Jinping announced the Belt and Road in Kazakhstan. And we know that 21 countries in the region are already signatories of the BRI. With Honduras's recent switch from Taiwan to China and President Lula's recent visit to Beijing, regional countries are seeking to strike a middle path between the United States and China. What will the region's relationship with China look like over the next decade? And what are the implications for US policy in the region? Well, we have an incredible, incredible set of speakers, legends um, in this space to talk about this. And our moderator is Mr. Jason Marsak, who is Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Adrian Arts Center for Latin American Studies. Sir? Excellent, thank you, Leland. Please. How's everyone feeling? Feeling good? We're, we're toward the end of the day, please. We're gonna go, we're gonna go boy, we're gonna go boy girl here. So Nicole, you're going here. Uh, Jorge right here in the middle, Margaret, Evan. Uh, can I just ask before we start, just everyone just stand up. There's a lot of people watching online as well. If you're watching online, I understand there's 150 people who are watching online earlier. Feel free to stand up if you're watching online as well. This is the last panel of the day. So I wanna get some energy into the room. This is a really, really important topic that we've been talking about all throughout the day. Uh, so you can feel free to sit down now. Um, <laughs> but uh, this has been an incredible, incredible series of conversations over the course of the day. And I just wanna start off by, Leland, don't leave. I wanna start off by thanking you for organizing a great conference. Where's Brian? I saw Brian over there before as others. Brian, Brian congratulations, uh, really great work. I'm thrilled to be joined by four excellent speakers here today. Uh, to talk about a topic that we've been talking about throughout the course of the day, which is which is China. Uh, and it's incredibly, incredibly important uh, for us to talk about that. The, today's conversation at the end of the here, we're talking about the title is In the Middle. And there couldn't be a more important title than In the Middle. It sums up perfectly because the region right now is caught in the middle. It's caught in the middle of growing geopolitical competition, which I think all of us on this on the stage here from our, our numerous interactions with public and private sector officials. Uh, and the region is really seeking to maximize the opportunities that are presented by, both by the United States and by, and by China as well. And uh, just, just in the last six weeks, just the last six weeks, what's happened? Brazil, Brazil's president, Lula, traveled to China. Uh, with, met with dozens of, uh, he brought dozens of representatives from, from Brazil, traveled with more than 200 business leaders. Uh, as I wrote at the time, uh, and that was an analysis that included Leland as well, and I saw Leland here, but he walked out. Uh, Leland's also a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Global China Hub. And we, yeah, I wrote that what cannot be missed in the, is the difference in pomp and delegation size between the China visit and Lula's visit to Washington just, just two months earlier. And then there's Honduras. It switched diplomatic relations from Taiwan to China only six weeks ago and summed that up at that time. I wrote that it was a quote unquote pragmatic move and that's essentially what Honduras was doing. We'll talk about that more throughout the panel today. And then we'll, we also have the results of the Paraguay election and I know Evan will have some comments on that election as well. We could also look at Chinese lending, right? Uh, economically, uh, Chinese development lending to the region has taken a rebound since its fall in, in 2000. Uh, Margaret runs a, a China finance database. We'll talk about that during the course of the panel today. And looking at last year, uh, fiscal year 2022, the U.S. allocated around $2 billion of total foreign investment to Latin America across uh, USAID, State Department, other sectors. Uh, last year, Chinese policy banks about 800, 800 million. So we see this US-China strategic competition that's playing out in a number of high-level visits across the region. Uh, we also see this playing out in other areas too. Uh, Admiral Craig Fowler, I love the collaboration that we consistently have with FIU. FIU, uh, Craig Fowler is a distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council. He's also a senior fellow here at the Stephen uh, J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. And he wrote recently that humanitarian assistance and, and di di disaster relief, it's a way to advance hemispheric prosperity, but it's also a way to reinforce US leadership at a time of global competition with the PRC. So there are a number of different things on the, uh, on the agenda here. I'm thrilled that the Adrian Arts Latin America Center is co-hosting this panel with, with FIU. So I've queued these topics all up. Let me go ahead now and introduce our, our panelists here. Um, 
Next to me, to my immediate left, is Nicole Wong. Nicole is the CEO and founder of WJ Consulting, which is a firm that advises on investment opportunities in Latin America. You're the co-founder of Hola Asia and the former Director General of Foreign Policy of Panama. So Nicole, thanks for coming. Thank you, thank you. Very happy to Panama. be here. Great to have you here. you and Atlantic Council. Fantastic. Uh, next to Nicole is Ambassador uh, Jorge Heine. Jorge is a research professor at the Frederick S. Pardee School of Global Studies at Boston University. As we're talking about foreign, not to be confused with the other, another Pardee Center at the University of Denver. He's also the interim director of the Pardee Center for the study of the longer range future. Of course, the former Chilean ambassador to China, India, and South Africa. But I think probably, Jorge, most important for your bio right now mm -hmm. is you also recently released a new book uh, a co-edited book titled Latin American Foreign Policy, Pol uh, Latin American For Foreign Policies in the New Order, New World Order, the Active Non-Alignment Option. Uh, and I think if there are copies of the book, Jorge will probably sign them for you here. Uh, so if you, you could order on Amazon, uh, two-hour delivery, and, and 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 bring them over, Jorge, I'll sign this for you. Uh, the uh, next to Jorge is Margaret Myers. Uh, Margaret is the director of the Asia and Latin America program at the Inter-American Dialogue, uh, where I say, uh, I'll say also, I regularly see Margaret's tremendous uh, work. She is also uh, a friend and that she's a, Wil a Wil she's a Wilson Center fellow, uh, where she's currently writing a book on China-Latin America relations. So Margaret, great to have you here. Thank you. Uh, at this part of this panel. And next to Margaret is Evan Ellis. Uh, Evan is a research professor of Latin American studies at the US Army War College of Strategic Studies Institute. He specializes in the region's relationship with China and other non-Western hemisphere actors. So if you have any very, very difficult questions on China, uh, Give him the Evan. He'll he'll be he, he knows how to answer them. We actually just hosted Evan on on Friday for a conversation on Paraguay's election mm -hmm. and what that could potentially mean for uh, uh, switching a, a relationship from from Taiwan to China. He's also one of the most prolific. I don't think Evan sleeps. Uh, he is probably <laughs> one of the most prolific writers I've ever seen. He's probably already written three articles over the course <laughs> of this conference uh, uh, today. So Evan, great to have you in there. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus. We have three themes to focus on over the course the next hour. We're going to talk about past opportunities and challenges for Latin America and the Caribbean engaging with the U.S. and China. We're going to talk about current priorities for the region and how the U.S. and China can assist with those priorities. And then we'll talk, and I think, frankly, most important, we'll talk about future trends, future trends, opportunities, challenges, and pick up on some of the conversation we've had over the course of the day. Specifically, I have some questions for the panel that they don't know about uh, because it cues off of, of some of the comments that General Richardson made earlier. I have one rule whenever I moderate a panel, which is time. And so I, we keep the answers short and pithy and, uh, and I'll jump in uh, as needed. Although with the caveat that the first question people can, panels can go on for, for a, a little bit longer to queue up their, their thoughts. Um, don't worry, we'll have time for a question and answer at the end. Nicole, I'm gonna start with you uh, because you have to, happen to take the seat of sitting, sitting next to me. Uh, but Latin American countries face the twin pillars of opportunities and challenges when engaging with China. And I think no country better embodies, or a few countries better embody that than, than Panama. You were actually very uh, instrumental in the decision uh, in 2017 as part of that uh, 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 to switch relations from Taiwan to China. On the year since, there was a landmark uh, port project that had been suspended. Uh, my notes said a bridge project had been paused, but Nicole corrected me before that bridge project as of last week is now back on. So there's now a bit bridge project that was paused and, and back on. But my question for you is, what are some of the lessons, what, are, what lessons about the opportunities and challenges of engaging with China can Panama share for other regional countries, uh, particularly maybe a country like Honduras, which recently made the, the same bet? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, first, I wasn't part of the decision. I was part of the, I was, I led the negotiations, but the decision was made by the president right. at the moment. You were you're part of what <laughs> happened at the time. Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. Um, one of the, I don't, one of the tips or the lessons that I, I would um, recommend to Honduras or to any country that has established relations with, with China will be three things. Okay. First, well, three, three things, awareness, long-term vision, and um, clarity. First, awareness. I think it's important for every country, especially in Latin America, to, to know its strengths and weaknesses. We have to recognize that, for example, we have very weak institutions that we, have, we are um, exposed to corruption 
more exposed than other countries in the, in, in, than the US or Canada. And um, by knowing this, we are aware on what do we have to take care of when we address a relationship with such a big country like China or any other country, any other big country. But we're talking about China and it's awareness is crucial and important and doing our researches and, and, and knowing what um, things happened in the past uh, with other countries not only in this region, but in, in Africa and in Asian countries, and well, here in, in Ecuador, in Bolivia, in other countries, we can then learn lessons around uh, what not to do and where to look to, to be careful. So what not to do, quick follow question. What would be the things from your experience looking back to 2017 that you would recommend maybe a country like Honduras that recently switched of what not to do? Yeah. Well, in Panama, when we made the decision, it was very clear that we didn't want to, for Chinese labor to build our infrastructure projects. So that was the first rule. Like if, if a Chinese company was going to be building a, uh, an infrastructure project, it was gonna be built by Panamanians. Um, another another um, thing where we were very, skeptical or very careful about, it was about the, the depths. We didn't want to get into a debt with China. Mm -hmm. So every uh, project that we have a, where a Chinese company is participating is being paid by a Panamanian a budget or by a financing scheme with not a Chinese financing scheme, but uh, for other foreign international uh, banks. Yeah. So Fantastic. Those are two thank, thank you, Nicole. That's that's great. That's a great way to start the conversation. We move to you, uh, Evan, because you recently returned from a research trip to to uh, to Panama, um, where you were speaking with a number of officials about U.S. Chinese uh, Panamanian stakeholders. Well, about analyze the state of Chinese investment in Panama. Uh, maybe build on some of Nicole's points: uh, awareness, long-term vision, clarity. Have you did you have you been, did you see that? panning out as part of your your trip to, to Panama, but also more, also where, what do you believe what U.S. policymakers are not seeing when it comes to regional preferences that drive the interest in engaging with, with, with China? Thanks, Jason. Um, well, certainly uh, Panama does have a, a combination of some of the challenges of governments, but also some of the challenges of strong institutions um, and, and dealing with a very uh, difficult uh, Chinese partner. Um, but I would also point out um, more broadly when you say, um, you know, what don't we see that um, we've been in a period with uh, you know, COVID-19 um, where we've been in a bit of a pause in terms of, of Chinese development financing, in terms of major projects. And in part, that's because a lot of things have been on hold, like the uh, the bridge uh, in, in Panama, but like a lot of other projects. Um, and it's given the illusion that uh, China is not moving forward quite as aggressively as they're moving forward. Um, but we are moving into a new phase, kind of as I follow this up more broadly. Uh, so what you see is, is certainly with the end of the zero COVID in China, that allows uh, SOE chiefs and others in China to begin to move forward and find and begin to uh, to, to move forward with those receptive deals in, in Latin America. Um, you find new areas of strategic emphasis, uh, not only uh, capturing the lithium, uh, access to lithium resources with the lithium supply chains, a big push in green energy transmission, also related things like electric vehicles, photovoltaic cells and things like that, um, expanded energy acquisitions, for example, the new $3 billion uh, acquisition uh, of NL assets in, in Peru, giving uh, Chinese companies control over literally almost 100% of all electricity uh, distribution there. Uh, you have other things like the evolution, although nobody's calling BRI dead, the evolution of BRI into global development initiative and global security initiative. You have a lot of progress uh, by Chinese companies as they become more sophisticated with public-private partnership projects, even in strongly institutionalized places like, like, like Chile. Uh, you have China's aggressive use of free trade agreements, not unlike what we do, um, but of course in, in Uruguay, uh, the possibility of a Mercosur free trade agreement, uh, Honduras and, and others. Um, and also it's uh, you see a lot of moves which are strategic as well as commercial. Certainly the flips to 
uh, from Taiwan to the PRC open up the space uh, to uh, have dramatic increases in influence in terms of, of business, in terms of Chinese work, telecommunications, relations with government and others. Uh, certainly some of the Chinese moves in terms of trying to dethrone the dollar, uh, currency swap agreements with Argentina, um, Brazil and others. Some of China's moves in the Caribbean, which is a, again, the critical US maritime strategic approach uh, to the United States. A lot of the Chinese moves in the digital spaces, not just 5G, but also things like cloud computing uh, um, uh, and also the battle over related standards. Some of the issues in the port sectors like Chiang Kai, uh, concerns about the dual use of ports as well as some of the dual use of, of space and, and, and cyber, and also the use of multilateral uh, domains, especially SLAC, but also some of the committee structures. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say, just to kind of wrap it up, is that it's not that our partners don't know, as Nicole so well said, that, that China is not a challenging partner. Um, the truth is that most partners in Latin America hope for the opportunity. Um, they believe that they can manage the risk through good governance um, in order to achieve the benefit. And that's always a bit of a calculation. Um, indeed, there was a fascinating poll that just came out in Colombia where 67% of all Colombians said that they want to increase their economic relationships with the PRC. And yet only 37% thinks that the PRC obeys environmental regulations and only 27% thinks that they follow human rights. And so oftentimes, what we're dealing with is a type of cognitive dissonance by a region that really hopes for the benefits and, and, and wants to kind of compartmentalize away from those other things. And the final thing I'll say, and we'll get back to this, I believe, um, but oftentimes when we say compete, 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 um, the U.S., and I would agree also with Ambassador Johnson fundamentally on, uh, on this, the U.S. cannot out-compete China. Our government is not set up for it. Washington, D.C. is not well for it. We are not fundamentally transactional. At the end of the day, it has to be the U.S. is part of the region, is a partner, having a dialogue and helping our, our partners take advantage of opportunities from China or others in a transparent, in a well-governed, in a well-considered way. Um, because if we try to do it any other way, we only generate resentment yeah. among the partners in the region. And, 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 and no country in the region wants to be in the middle, in the middle. No country in the region wants to be in the middle of a competition either, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. we don't have the, this is not the way the U.S. is set up, but there's also not, it also is not going to curry favor with, with friends across the hemisphere. I mean, this goes I think Ambassador Heinehorn, this goes to, to your book, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which I, I'll, I'll admit I haven't had, a, I've read the description of the book. I've read the chapters. I haven't had a chance to actually read it, but- uh, The reviews I, are coming out. I, I will with the, with the signed copy, but let's talk, <laughs> let's talk about some of the ideas from your book, um, uh, which I, I just, I find that the overall um, perspective just incredibly uh, fresh and, and nuanced and, and very much needed to better understand why the region and why other countries in the, in the, in the we'll use the word global south are, are, are the position was there. So do you see there being a, a disconnect between many countries' interest in kind of staying in the middle non-aligned position versus what the U.S. and China each desire? And what does that thereby mean for the ability and how we're engaging with countries in the region? Are we are we doing it the right? Are we engaging in the right way, or we should be thinking about other ways to to strengthen those partnerships uh, that are different from from this more of this kind of competition based modeling that we're, we've been discussing. Well, thank you, Jason. And first of all, let me thank uh, Florida International University for inviting me. Uh, I started my career in Caribbean studies when I was teaching in Puerto Rico at the Inter American University first, and then at the University of Puerto Rico in Mayagüez. And I interacted in those years very much with such uh, FIU stalwarts as Mark Rosenberg, Tony Mango, Barry Levine, sadly departed now. I wrote for Caribbean Review, that great journal, and I had never been to FIU. So for me to be uh, invited here is a real privilege and I really uh, appreciate this. So now you're on the hot spot to get invited back again next year. That's right, yeah. <laughs> and it's good to see uh, Jason in person. We have been interacting for the past three years, quite a bit of Zoom, but yes. we hadn't yeah. actually met. So I'm glad, five inches taller on Zoom. That's right. <laughs> so glad to be here. And uh, let me just say that uh, the title of this panel really hits uh, the nail uh, on the head. And uh, our countries in Latin America have had, uh, you know, the uh, sad uh, situation of being uh, in the middle, precisely. We have been uh, stuck between a rock and a hard place in the course of the past, you know, three or four years. Uh, because of this, uh, you know, some would say spot, others would use stronger terms between the United States uh, and uh, China. 
And it was this that led us in 2020, three years ago, with my colleagues, Carlos Fortin and Carlos Ominami, to publish a piece in Foreign Affairs Latin America, the Latin American version of the journal, on what we call active non-alignment and the need for our region and the countries of the region to take a stance that was not automatically siding with Washington, not automatically siding with Beijing, but rather charting our own course. Now, we got a lot of flack on that, that was antiquated, didn't respond to the needs of the 21st century. What is this? Who cares about this? Totally anachronistic. Well, uh, some people in the region thought it was a good idea. We published a book in Spanish on it, November 21, and then an English edition that came out uh, just a couple of months ago. And of course, as you know very well, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine and that very uh, tragic war that we watch every evening on our television screens, suddenly the world rediscovered, as it were, non-alignment. And non-alignment is now all over the place. On the cover of The Economist two weeks ago, uh, on the cover of Foreign Affairs in the current issue. And so non-alignment is back. Uh, we would like to say active non-alignment is back. Um, what President Lula is doing right now, it seems to us, very much expresses that notion. He does not side either with the position of the G7 or the position of Russia. What he is trying to do is to aim for peace. And he is doing it very proactively. Now, some would say, you know, a Latin American country, South American country, what does it have to do with Europe? Why should it be, you know, messing in the big leagues, as it were? Well, Brazil is a big country, there's a lot to say. And it is taking that uh, position and it is doing it quite actually, we don't know what will happen, but what Brazil is doing is precisely this active non-alignment. In fact, his former foreign minister, current chief advisor, uh, Celso Amorim has the concluding chapter in our book called Brazil and the Global South. Now, what we are saying, and my country, it seems to be Chile, is a very good example that you can actually do. There are only six countries in the world that have FTAs, both with China and with the United States. Chile is one of them. Chile has had traditionally very good relations with the United States, and it's also had very good relations with China. So this is not some sort of utopia that it cannot be done. It can be done if you set your mind to it. And here I would have a bit of a, a disagreement with uh, my colleagues who spoke before me in terms of the notion of competition. What we argue is that precisely the idea should be to compete. We understand there is a great power competition in the world. That's in the nature of international relations. This is how it works. There's nothing surprising about it. Now, what we object to in the region and in the book is this notion that what you do is you exclude some countries from the hemisphere. You call them extra regional powers, that somehow they shouldn't be here that Latin American countries should go back to the, quote, good old days in which they only related to the United States and to Western Europe, and that the rest of the world didn't exist. Well, we disagree with that. What the region wants in its priority is development. Any country that can contribute to that challenge is welcome to take part, to do trade, to invest in the region. And it seems to us that the notion that the United States thinks that it cannot compete with China in Latin America is so un-American in so many ways, it seems to me. The United States is the ultimate competitor in so many ways. That is what has made this, great, this country great. You built a better mousetrap, and this is what you want to do. You don't tell Latin American countries, no, you exclude this country, you exclude this other country. We don't like their politics. They shouldn't build this bridge. They shouldn't make the tunnel. What kind of competition? That's not competition. That's monopoly. So, uh, Hori, I, I want to I want to go back. To, we'll go back to that later on. I think that's a question that was queued up earlier in this conversation about them. Oh. You know, how how what what? Uh, we'll go to. I don't, don't want to preview my question, but thinking more about kind of how the U.S. can uh, focus on development. Uh, but I think it's, it's really interesting your point on you know active non-alignment is mm -hmm. is back, and then what are the implications of active non-alignment? How should U.S. U.S. policy uh, uh, take into consideration? this, what we're seeing in, in Brazil right now, insofar as active non-alignment, and, and, and as you mentioned in, in Chile. Sure. Uh, I want to go to, I want to bring Margaret in. Uh, Margaret, um, you, um, 
uh, uh, Ambassador Heine and Nicole have uh, described a number of, of trends. Evan as well. Uh, Nicole started us off talking about the three things to take into consideration, awareness, long-term vision, clarity, uh, the difference in working with the, the, the labor market, the debt financing with, with Panama's case. Uh, uh, Hori just talked about active non-alignment. How, how do you see some of these trends impacting the, the Chinese private sector's efforts to better integrate into markets in Latin America and the Caribbean? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really timely question, uh, Jason, because I think we're entering something. When I talk to my students about the China-Latin America dynamic, I tend to talk about different phases in the China-Latin America dynamic. This is sort of an ever-evolving right, relationship. Um, really over the past couple of decades or even more, depending upon how you measure it. Um, and what we, where we are now is what I call the fifth phase, right? We're entering a new, a new period. It's something of a crossroads. You have a Latin America that's coming out of the pandemic that is facing some pretty dire economics consequences of the pandemic in, in addition to a wide range of other challenges, many of which we've heard about today. You also have China that is grappling with its own economic challenges, structural in nature, many of them, uh, you know, and an overheated uh, real estate market, property market that's causing all sorts of challenges uh, at home, uh, recalibrations, recalculations about how to achieve at least moderate rates of economic growth into the future. And so you're, this is a, a new moment with new limitations and both actors coming together to figure out how to engage with these new realities in mind. Um, and what we see sort of across the board is uh, an interest really on both sides in engaging in sectors, and many of which have been mentioned today that are related to energy transition and often to climate change and reindustrialization and a handful of other issues that tend to be of interest to both parties for various reasons. On the China side, these are sectors where we see you know, a lot of innovation, and prospects for, high, for growth and productivity, which will be absolutely critical to China if it is to grow at high rates in the future. And so th these are the areas, you know, and largely where we'll see, you know, more and more focus over time. And I tend to say that, you know, depending upon how China's economy develops, uh, we're going to see more investment in an in even more focused set of sectors. So the BRI of old, how we used to think about it, major infrastructure projects traversing the entirety of the continent is over. I like to say the BRI is dead, long live the BRI. You know, we're in a new sort we're of just iteration. We're at the anniversary of September. Right? Exactly. A new iteration of this. And, and certainly the there are new, uh, a whole wide range of new alphabet soup acronyms being introduced by China to develop, to you know, introduce new concepts of, of international engagement in foreign policy. But, um, but in any case, we're seeing a, a very clear shift into new, new sectors, right, um, that are of interest to both sides. At the same time, and related to all of this, is a mutual learning process, right, on the part of Latin American actors, as was mentioned, right, uh, in terms of balancing the, you know, competitive interests of the U.S. and China in the region, um, grappling with all of the things that, that Evan mentioned, and on the part of Chinese actors. And so you see the confluence of this as well, right? And it's kind of unclear how all of this is going to play out. So you have discussions about how to negotiate effectively to ensure best outcomes in some of these, these newer deals and in deals that have not been struck before because these are new and emerging sectors, right? And on the other hand, you have conversations within companies and within ministries in China about what is risk? How do we measure it? And how do we ensure that we do not fall into some of the traps that in many cases, you know, we're very, very bad reputationally speaking for the BRI. And these conversations are ongoing in China constantly. And indeed, within the Ministry of State Security and the Ministry of Public Security, some of which have people implanted within the decision making boards of these companies who are making decisions on the ground with security related implications in mind. So it's a whole new world, in other yeah. words, this fifth phase in the China-Latin America relationship. And so I think this is going to be a very interesting time to watch how things develop. But all of this makes tremendous sense to me. And indeed, you know, a lot of the things that were just mentioned are being reacted to on the ground in various different ways by both sides. So, you know, this new world, we'll get, we'll get to the future trends, but I think maybe, Margaret, perhaps this new shift in Chinese investment, investment priorities, could frankly also open up new opportunities for how the U.S. thinks about its, its investment 
partnerships in, in the region in which we hadn't previously thought about as as China is in the midst of 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 of, of rethinking itself. And you know, Jorge, to your point, how, then how does that what does that mean for the region itself that doesn't want to be you know wants to the act of non-alignment is back, so it mm -hmm. doesn't want to be kind of caught in the middle of a of a geostrategic competition. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I want to go back to you. I want to shift to now talking about current priorities before. Uh, uh, you know, before we talk toward the end about the future. Um, but Evan, you also recently traveled, you were also recently in, in Colombia. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's, the, it's, maybe it's the number of flights you do that allows you to be <laughs> such a prolific work. You were recently in, in Colombia and you were analyzing China's security cooperation with, with Colombia. Um, Colombia has begun to expand its outreach uh, with, with China. Um, uh, Congressman diaz Blart talked a little bit about Colombia during his mm -hmm. intervention earlier. Uh, but Colombia remains one of the U.S.'s top regional uh, partners on subjects ranging from environmental converse, conversation uh, or conservation to uh, narco trafficking. How has China been able to find a niche for itself in its relations with Colombia that differentiates its, its offer from the United States, especially the, the relationship? I think from, mm. particularly interesting the Colombia relationship because Colombia has always been referred to, and I've done that myself, as you know the linchpin of U.S. policy in the region, and so. China has been able to find that that entry point. How has it been able to find that entry point with this longstanding U.S. ally? Great question, Jason. Um, and also, it's important to point out that the way that China has pursued opportunities in Colombia and Chinese business persons is very different than the way, for example, that Brazil, with that massive uh, trip by by the uh, President Lula's delegation, and, and that very explicit content with with, with BRICS and, and involving China in the Russia-Ukraine peace deal, et cetera, et cetera, which is also very different than what you see with with China and um, and Venezuela, et cetera. So recognizing that that Colombia is, is one among a variety of, of different uh, Chinese foreign policy postures in, in the region. Um, but it's interesting, in Colombia, despite the politics of the new Petro administration, what you've really seen is, is a penetration that comes from business persons pursuing business relationships um, and individuals, um, and frankly, um, across a number of different areas. And I would just emphasize a couple techniques that I've seen. Uh, number one certainly is adapt adaptation and learning. Um, so for example, when um, the first big break, uh, a project called Mar Tres, when, when China came in, uh, China Harbor in other um, it was disastrous. Their overuse of Chinese workers, their technology, their tunnel building equipment. Um, it, uh, you know, the Colombian government literally had to intervene. Um, but as they've learned, um, you know, now of course with the foothold with the Bogota Metro, with Rio Tram, with Metro de Ochenta in, in Medina, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's that process of, of continuing to figure out how to be more effective within the Colombian system. Number two, the process of expanding human networks, that the people to people networks. Um, and you see this in every country, but for example, um, a couple of years ago when I was in Colombia, um, the China, uh, Columbia Chamber of Commerce had about 30 companies on them, very few Chinese companies. Uh, when I came back this time, 140 companies with China Harbor's own vice president, Xu Gu, actually positioned as the vice president of, of, of the chamber. So um, really kind of ingratiating and, and building themselves within the Colombian business elite. Number three, incrementalism. So you have certain companies that try to jump in all at once with us enormous problems. Others, for example, like Huawei, that literally for about 20 years has built a presence working with local talent, local managers, uh, local tech reps, etc. Um, and uh, I mean, he's even learned, I mean, the, the biggest mistake I always say that, that Huawei made was um, it was uh, sponsoring uh, the um, sponsoring Santa Fe instead of Millonarios in, in Bogota. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, sponsoring local soccer teams, things like that. Um, and number four, um, also cooperation among Chinese companies. So, for example, the way that, that powered China has worked not only with its own subsidiary Sino Hydro, but also a number of other different wind and solar projects to little by little kind of advance the Chinese cause. You see the same thing with CNPC and CPB and, and Carehui and, and others. Um, but it, it's little by little, um, and although I think it could become more political, especially with the new Colombian ambassador, um, Sergio Cabrera um, in, in Beijing now, but for now, it's uh, China has been cautious and it's been mostly business focused um, among the different Colombian businesses. And, you know, that goes back to Hori's point before about just practical and Nicole, your point, Margaret, practical focused, de development focused. I think one point you mentioned there, Evan, 
which is cru crucial, is people-to-people -people contacts, right? I mean, this has been always one of the ways in which the U.S. relationship with Latin America and the Caribbean has been so strong because our tremendous people-to-people -people contacts. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've seen, I've seen this, you've seen them, I'm sure everyone in the panel has seen the, the, the degree to which the people to people contacts has significantly increased with China, including, you know, China inviting officials, inviting uh, others from ministries to come to China for trainings, uh, learn about China, spend, spend two weeks and, uh, and, and learn about how great the culture is. So, so you know, that, that kind of people to people is, is so important. We've seen that in the U.S. relationship over the years. I wanna, I'm going to go to you, Jorge, then, then Nicole, I'm coming back to you after that. But Jorge, I want to talk about... Um, Critical minerals, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I have to ask about critical minerals because you're 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 Chilean. Uh, but on the subject, uh, Chile has received a lot of uh, attention, of course, for its massive, absolutely massive lithium deposits. Of mm -hmm. course, uh, uh, lithium is absolutely critical for uh, energy transition, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and and for when we look at the green energy transition points that uh, Margaret was bringing up as well. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, especially as we're talking about the active non-alignment uh, is back, how do you see the current balance and decision-making unfolding and how Chile, but also other countries are deciding their respective partnerships in regard to natural resource extraction, especially the critical mineral supply chains. I mean, there's been a tremendous um, uh, investment from China in, in the critical mineral supply chains. And so what, what, is, what's been, what is the thinking from countries and mm -hmm. so far as deciding on those partnerships uh, and, uh, and what might that mean moving forward? Sure, so it's a great question. And uh, right now, there's been quite a bit of coverage of uh, Chile's uh, lithium policies. I saw about you know 10 days ago or so when President Boric gave a speech on lithium policy. And in some medium, it was covered like uh, Chile nationalizes uh, lithium. Well, that's not true among other things because it's already been nationalized. You know? By law, Chile's lithium belongs to the state. It cannot be, you know, uh, given to uh, private companies, uh, you know, sold forever. The only way it can be used is through some sort of lease or concession for a certain period of time. That's the only way it works according to current law. So that's the first thing that's important to state. Now, what uh, President Boric wants to do is to establish a state-owned company that will aim to process lithium a bit more. I mean, the story of Chile and its natural resources is one that we always end up exporting these natural resources to the rest of the world and adding very little value to it. We do it with copper. Chile is the biggest producer and export of copper. 29% of the world's reserves of copper are in Chile. Um, China, of course, is the biggest importer of copper and we export a large amount of copper to China, but we don't refine very much copper in Chile. Uh, and the danger that uh, we see in Chile is that much the same may happen with lithium. Uh, given the tremendous growth in you know, e-mobility that uh, we are seeing in the world uh, and the critical role that both copper and lithium play in e-batteries, well, uh, there's an opportunity there. Now, what I find fascinating is that in this particular instance, uh, you know, a, a US company, Albert Marley and uh, uh, Tianqi Lithium, a Chinese company, are in Chile. Uh, and they are both very reluctant to somehow, um, you know, allow some of these processing to take place in Chile. The argument from both US companies and Chinese companies is batteries should be made where the markets are. They should be made, you know, in, at the end of the world. And uh, that, it seems to me, is a real challenge. In, it, it seems to me it's something that the Chilean government, now that there's all this interest and in, there are going to be bids for new deposits of uh, lithium so that uh, some companies can get concessions for you know, a certain amount of time. Well, the challenge there is to look for ways in which uh, more lithium can be processed in Chile. And you know, what I find interesting is that the message we are getting both from Chinese and from US companies that there isn't much interest 
in that. And yeah. perhaps that can be changed. Yeah. Thank you very much. I want to go to a quick uh, lightning round. Uh, I'm going to ask for maybe a 15 second response to this question before we look to the future. And I got my eye on the clock because uh, we're, this panel is separating you from whatever your evening plans are as well. Uh, but lightning round, what is the one thing, I'll start with you, Nicole, one thing that is being overlooked when it, we've talked about a lot so far on this panel, one thing that's being overlooked in regard to how China is engaging with the region. What's one thing that we that hasn't been talked about? I think that the the gap that exists in knowledge between China and Latin America. The gap that exists in knowledge yeah. between the two. Hori, what do you think? One thing I think, the, yeah, I think the key thing is that China comes to Latin America and talks about development, and that is a key concern. And often, when often people talk about China's presence in Latin America, they forget that. And to talk about development and allocate resources to it resonates. Fantastic, uh, Margaret. I'm gonna say two really, really fast things. So one is the trade dynamic. Well, if we're talking competition with China, if the US is talking competition with China, it's, it's, it's trade, it's trade, right? Yeah. I mean, we need trade relationships. And so when you have Ecuador coming and banging on the door and saying, please, can we have a, a free trade agreement or some sort of trade agreement and us saying no, then, and then China offering just the same, even though it may be structured a bit differently, that, that really does send something of a signal to the region. And so much of what China, so much of China's leverage, so much of its influence, and including on policy coordination, right, with these countries comes from the, the extensive trade that's underway. And then the other thing I'll say just very, very fast, so much is happening at the local I'm counting level. slowly to 15. <laughs> huh? I'm counting slowly to 15. <laughs> I think so much is happening at the local level. Um, I, I've talked about this a lot. I don't know that it's not talked about. But if we're talking about competing, if US companies are talking about competing with China, we have to recognize that China is engaging so far upstream in, in before some of these projects are even in the mind's eye of local officials, right? In municipalities, in states, in, in provinces, right? That, it, that they are natural candidates, obviously, to carry out these projects once they, the bidding process comes around. And so competing with that will require a much more strategic approach on the part, not just of US actors, but many others as well. All right, so. Evan. It win-win means Latin American elites looking for short short term gains in, in in Chinese elites with with goals looking to give it to them. Um, at the end of the day, it, it's the power of the personal relationships, um, not wanting to lose access, not wanting to come across as ungrateful or uneducated. It's the hopes for personal benefit. It's the hopes for state benefit, um, and the effect of that in not speaking out, not wanting to openly work against China, um, and in the process, really circumventing a hard, a serious discussion of what types of principles of how you do business are best for Latin America and their long-term growth and their ability to keep with the value added. Fantastic. Now we have 15 minutes. I have, I have one more question because I want to actually, it's a question that panelists don't know about, but actually I want to try to answer the question that General Richardson posed during her lunchtime intervention. Uh, but feel free to start thinking about your questions to come to the, the microphones. Uh, but I think one, one question I'm going to start with, I'll start with, uh, I'll start with you last bit cold, but I'll start with you, Hori. Uh, General Richardson, um, among other things, she I think she asked the question about how should the U.S. better being be better engaging with our partner nations. What what more should we be doing? What what more should we be thinking about? That was one, I think one of the questions that she posed to to think about as part of this conference. From your perspective, I'm going to start with uh, Jorge and Nicole from a Chile Panama, but also kind of broader regional. And then Evan and Margaret afterwards from the U.S. perspective. But Jorge, what from your perspective from the re what? what 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 does what does Chile what does other countries in the region want from the U.S. that we should be doing differently, looking mm. to the future to be better engaging? Sure. Well, I will say this: I have been struck by the degree to which you know the whole notion of infrastructure and why infrastructure is sig significant for the region, which was derided for much of the recent past. You know, BRI was denounced as you know belt diplomacy, building white elephants. It doesn't do anybody any good, and so on and so forth. And now, well, the G7 has come around, the US has come around, but maybe perhaps this is needed. Uh, and they are coming up with projects and, and to do that. So it seems to me the key point here is if the United States engages the real development needs of the region, it can make a tremendous difference. And we would all be better off. We want US companies in Latin America competing for bids, presenting your know, intenders. They aren't doing that. You know, U.S. construction companies do not engage in projects, do not participate in projects in Latin America. It seems to me 
that's uh, our loss. Better, from your perspective, better, better engagement on core development priorities that are fundamental to the people and the leaders in the region. Nicole. Well, I think, I don't know if it exists, but I haven't read it yet. I don't know a, a, a formal policy with foreign policy towards uh, Latin America from the US that, that doesn't exist. I haven't read it. Um, therefore, so we don't feel that two, we're- two pages, actually more pages yeah. than usually in the national security strategy. <laughs> in the last well, there, therefore we don't feel that there's not, not a feeling of a feeling a priority or, or important in, in such a way. And also another approach that the US should revisit is that we, we have a, a whole, a, a holistic, a very multidimensional uh, agenda with the US, Latin America and the US. And maybe the approach on the China matter should be that, hey, we have this holistic agenda, this so complete agenda, and with China is very economic commercial. So we can, we can take advantage of this agenda and put it out there and, yeah. and make it a more, strategic. So more more a holistic, strategic, fantastic. More of a highlight. More highlight, holistic. Yes. I'm gonna go now to you, uh, Margaret, and then, and then Evan, and then from the US perspective, what, do you, what are tools at our disposal that have been underutilized uh, to, we could, I use the word, we could use the word compete or to better show the importance of US partnership uh, in the region uh, on, on issues that are, not every issue perhaps, but the issues that are most important to US national, we're at the Hemispheric Security Conference, issues of top national security importance to the US. What tools have we done underutilized uh, to strengthen our partnership in technology, for example, critical minerals? What's, what's at our, yeah. what's, what's at our, what are some of the you know, arrows in our quiver that we just haven't utilized? Or we should be thinking. So yeah, or could utilize better. I, I mean, on the communication point or or policy point, just to underscore what was just said, you know, it's really critical that we communicate that, or that we that that our Latin America policy is not a China policy, right? And and I think we're doing a better job of that than we have in the past. But I think there's still progress to be made in that respect. Nobody in Latin America wants the Latin America policy to be based on competition with China, right? It needs to be engagement based on what we see as a mutually beneficial dynamic within the Western hemisphere. So that's really quite critical. I would say also, uh, I mean, I, I completely echo Brian Fonseca's point about, you know, our strategy being private sector led. Um, I, we, I understand that why that is in the structure of our economy and the structure of our foreign direct investment and the way things are done. But uh, you know, if the conditions are not there on the ground for, for companies to be interested in investing, then we're just not going to see the numbers that we would hope. And especially in those sectors where there are more risks involved. And those happen to be the sectors where China is engaging more extensively. So we need to think about this model, not that I'm saying we need an industrial policy per se, but there needs to be greater thinking about how, how to make some of these investments happen in sectors that we deem most critical. On the um, uh, one area where China talks all of the time about, you know, its efforts and its commitments is reindustrialization or industrial competitiveness and helping the region to achieve this. I think there are examples of China doing this. There are also a lot of empty promises. And I do believe that this is one area where the US has and can very clearly commit to and support objectives in the region across sectors, including in strategic sectors of interest to both the US and, and Latin America. And we have only so many resources. We have made this point time and again this, you know, today. Um, we cannot compete dollar to dollar, but if we are going to compete, we ought to focus on an area that is of critical importance to the region, and that indeed is one. And that was one that was a feature of the Brazil-China, you know, uh, dialogues as well. So that's I think another. And one more thing I would say is simply that we're talking about friendshoring. Maybe we need a little bit more interpretate liberal interpretation of what what friends are. Um, and I know that's controversial to say, can be controversial to say, but we need to think about not just our best, best friends in the region, but those that we need to engage with and that we are losing in a way, right, in terms of overall influence and partnership um, to, to other actors. And so just a reconceptualization of that notion as well, I think would be helpful. Fantastic. Well, Margaret, you and me and Evan, we all live in Washington where the word friend, uh, everyone's, every, well, there are many friends in, in, in Washington. Uh, so maybe that liberal definition of friend. But I, I want to, uh, Evan, I want to ask you as well the same question about what tools are at our disposal have been underutilized, but then also maybe add on to that. The, the last year, the Summit of the Americas, the U.S. announced the America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity. Uh, that's um, It's moving forward. 
I would say not at a pace in which many of the conversations I have with regional leaders would would want. Um, you know, I think part of part of the concern that I always have is, well, this administration is announcing APEP. We have Build Back Better World. The past administration had America Crece. Every administration has its own policy, and there's, I think, frankly, maybe there's a a, a lack of um, appreciation in the region for the for the for the fact that any of these initiatives will actually move forward for for anything beyond just one particular administration so and, and and that's obviously very different from the way that china operates so what are what are some of the from that what are some of the tools that you're, you've been thinking about and what, what could we be doing across the u.s government in a way and this goes back to some of the things that southcom has been trying to do insofar as its partnerships but what are some of the, the things that look in the future that we need to utilize better that we've just become a little bit complacent about where the u.s strategy could be most effective in, in bringing partner nations on board absolutely and it's wide ranging but let me try to be brief oh so first of all i think we need to do a much better job of selling our brand and that brand is not often what we assume that that brand is um, but as General Richardson, you know, it, it said when she talked about you know, team democracy, um, we, the United States, in our you know largely private sector system, although it's not giving the best shiny goodies and bridge projects like like the Chinese and their SOEs often do. Um, but um, when Latin Americans sell to the U.S. market, the amount of value added that stays in Latin America is pretty impressive. When a U.S. company, vis-a-vis -vis often a Chinese company, um, becomes a local employer, their adherence to corporate social um, responsibility standards. Standards, um, the way the opportunities they create for their employees, including oppor um, opportunities for employees in, in upper management, the way that they relate to local uh, communities is, is pretty impressive. Um, when a country that doesn't have maybe strong institutions brings a U.S. company in versus a, a Chinese company, just in, in general terms, um, the ability to reach out and, and keep an eye on that U.S. company through things you know like um, you know, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, et cetera, et cetera, versus the willingness of the Chinese. I mean, I mean heck, the Chinese only even admit that, that that they export fentanyl to you know to, to, to Mexico, um, and so I, I think there's a lot we can do to really not say hey we just we give you more, but talk about the value of working with U.S. as a partner, and also the value of working with U.S. as a security partner in terms of the quality of our training programs, the value of working with U.S. as as, as a media partner where we think people we teach people to question authority, we we teach um, our, our military partners to respect democracy and, and human rights, et cetera, et cetera. USAID. Is, is came up before, you know, we, we teach people to make good decisions and not just buy a future line of, of Chinese things. So I think selling the brand is, is, is number one. Um, and, and, and number two, and I would respectfully um, disagree just a little bit with, with, with my, 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 my dear senior friend, Jorge. Um, That's I, I always like a little bit of disagreement at panel makes it a little bit more. Exciting. <laughs> From a from a if, if I were if I were a Latin American elite, sure, the thing that I would most like is a competition between the United States and, and China. Okay, you tell me what you want to give me. You tell me what you want to give me. Don't tell me how to run my government. Let me be as corrupt as I want. Let me be as bad government as I want. But I'll decide which goodies I want from from who. Um, and at the end of the day, the people will happen. What always happens with the Latin American people, the the difficulty is that um. It, it, at the end of the day, the United States has a stake in, in this region. So what I would argue that we need to do a better job of um, using our tools to insist on transparency, which lets the Latin Americans get the better deal. We need to do a better job in, in helping our Latin partner um, plan on, on the front end things, interesting things uh, Southcom does with the U.S. Corps of Engineers. Evan, Evan, um, I'm going to jump in here because we have, we have a five minutes left and I see two questions already. So selling the brand. Uh, U.S. technical know-how. I want to make sure that we get to both questions, and and again, uh, don't want to keep you late as well. So let's go to Ambassador Johnson, then we'll go to you, Leland. Okay. I can hear you, but I'm not sure. Uh, is the mic working? The mic's not working. Leland, is your mic working over there? Neither mic is working. Um, Oh, it's working now. Okay. Yeah, I so, uh, I, yeah, I'll be, I'll be fast. There's, I didn't want to say this before the panel, but I, I do want to say it now, and I, I know Evan sees it coming. My argument has always been that there is very little, in most cases, unique that China can find in Latin America that it can't find closer to home. Mm -hmm. Very little, and I love Latin America, and I know in some cases there are unique things but very little that they can't find closer to the other side of the planet where China is, Africa, Eastern Europe, so forth. But for China, if a democracy fails, 
if a government changes, if an economy collapses, they are probably going to benefit from the chaos. On the other hand, when I look at the United States, and we don't have to be innocent in this, we find ourselves geopolitically in a place where we want you to be successful. We want you to succeed. We want you to be a prosperous, safe place because that's good for us. So to add that punctuation mark, make it simple. Am I right? Okay, <laughs> fantastic. Is, is the ambassador right? Uh, Leland, let's, we'll take your both questions together. Okay, I got one question for Margaret and one question for Nicole. Hi, Margaret. I don't know if you can't see me. <laughs> um, but uh, you talked about the five phases of China's engagement in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, could you just summarize the, the first four? Because um, you only talked about the fifth. But if you can summarize the first four. And then um, what you had just talked about in terms of China working so far upstream before it's even in the mind's eye uh, of the locals about a certain development project. You know, I think one way in which they do that is active engagement in the local Chinese diaspora. And which is my question for Nicole, you know, the Chinese diaspora within Panama is very active, right? You got the Puente de las Americas and you have that mural that shows 150 uh, years of engagement. Uh, you have the Chinese community in El Dorado. So what are some examples on, on which the Chinese embassy engages with the local Chinese population in order to um, win certain projects and increase influence? Great, thank, thank you. Um, I think we have, um... We had two questions. We're, we're almost at five o'clock. So I could say, you know, um, what maybe go about five minutes over. Is that okay, Leland? You're you're the you're in charge here. Uh, let's take uh, take the ambassador's question first. We'll either uh, Hor can I take it? Yes, you could take it. So, sure. uh, and I think Evan wants to take it. So, so one of you one of you has to agree with him. One of you has to maybe disagree with him. <laughs> ambassador Jones, thank you very much for your question. Um, I think you are wrong. Let me just uh, mention one thing. You know, we talk about oil. We talk about all sorts of things. The most fundamental thing human beings need is food. China has 19% of the world's population. It has 7% of the world's arable land. It is 7% of the world's freshwater reserves. In South America, that combination is almost exactly the opposite. So China will never be able to feed itself. It will always depend on imported food. And South America is an excellent position uh, to do that. Uh, in the case of Chile, believe it or not, we sell $2 billion worth of cherries to China in one year. This is one fruit to one country. And you know what happened with soybeans and so on. So I rest my case. Evan. Yeah. Sure. sure. Um, the ambassador is always right, but. <laughs> <laughs> so. For, <laughs> for, so, so first of all, clearly there are some things like 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 agricultural goods, uh, like like minerals, where, where China looks throughout the world uh, for, for those things. Um, but the flip side of, of that is that China is not just after that. And so I'd, I'd make I think two very important points here. So number one, when a state like like Paraguay, some of the debates inside of Paraguay before the elections of, of how Paraguay would dramatically increase its participation in the beef value added chain, or when Costa Rica flipped, how Costa Rica would sell so many more undifferentiated fruit products. Um, at the end of the day, um, when China can buy all the fruit that it wants from the Philippines, there's a reason that it, you know, would sign the special deals with Costa Rican elites to bring refrigerated contain containers of, of fruit all the way around the world. And so oftentimes what you find is China's strategic use of its market demand in pursuit of, of political ends, although there are commercial ends as well. Um, and the other piece I think was very important, Ambassador Johnson pointed out, is that the United States uh, immigration, drugs, good governance, cooperation, we have very tangible, immediate stakes in the region that China does not have. And indeed, in many ways, um, by undermining democracy in some ways, um, you know, cooperation on, on Venezuela or, or, or other things, it's oftentimes in China's strategic interests to have that resistance to the United States. And so in many ways, we have stakes in good governance that working with our partners through transparency and strong institutions and things like that, um, we can maintain, help maintain a level playing field. Um, but it's important for us in ways it's, it's not uh, important for, 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 for China. So, so I think kind of understanding kind of the, the span of, of where the Chinese interests are. Fantastic, thank you, Evan. Uh, let's go to Margaret, uh, finish your, your uh, uh, Lee Wen's question on the, the different phases and 
No, sure. Nicole, you'll have the. I'll be. I'll be very quick about it, and anyone is welcome to join my class. <laughs> We'd like a more extensive explanation. The first is starts. I mean, this all starts with the period of an, China's engagement in Latin America has gone on for very, very, very many years, hundreds of years in many cases, depending upon you know the type of activity that we're talking about. But this is all about the enhanced phases in Chinese engagement, which really date back to the mid 1990s. So the first phase is you know the mid 1990s and around till, till around 2013, during which. You know, China's engagement with the region was largely driven by uh, what's called the going out strategy, which has three tenets, right? Which resource acquisition, markets, new finding new markets for Chinese goods and internationalizing Chinese companies. And that drove so much of the engagement that we saw then still does today to a considerable degree, but was a major thrust of, of, of activity at that particular juncture. The second, in my view, starts around 2013 when Xi Jinping became president. There was a sort of shift in foreign policy, but we also saw the the sort of incipient BRI come into, uh, into form. Um, and a lot of deals, connectivity enhancing deals, infrastructure deals, and all sorts of other things struck at the time, including in Latin America, which was not part of the BRI then, uh, but to achieve a lot of domestic aims in China related to, to China's domestic reform process. The third, 2018, uh, which was when Latin America officially became part of the Belt and Road Initiative, and it became an official after the Arctic, by the way, right? And it became officially a global a global initiative. Um, and then this incorporates also the COVID era, uh, where we saw a lot of interesting innovations, changes, a, a very extensive focus on tech, on the digital Silk Road, on the health Silk Road, and all wide ranging other features of the relationship. And then now the fifth is is what we're experiencing, and this is you know the result of a lot of new gl global realities and uh, external inputs. So um, that's how I break it down. You could break it down in a lot of other ways, but that's how I sort of conceptualize it. On uh, just on you know the actors that are doing this upstream engagement. First of all, I'd say it's co-produced, right? It's not just China engaging. There are a lot of Latin American actors that are involved in this as we all know, uh, including within the diaspora communities, right? Um, that are helping to facilitate and very much seeking out these deals in many, in many cases. Uh, but the network of actors has absolutely exploded. Chinese actors on the ground sort of carrying these things out. It ranges from embassy officials, right, to um, delegations coming from sister provinces or sister cities uh, to universities seeking out partnerships, for example, in lithium exploration and studies, special centers being set up, PR firms, Chinese PR firms that do a lot of sort of the groundwork. The number of actors, they aren't all coordinated, but sometimes they are, right? And certainly the things that they're pursuing are very much in line in many cases with these you know, sectors of strategic interest. Um, and so uh, we did a paper with FIU and with Southcom called Going Local, if anyone's interested in really, you know, wanting to read more about this, wherein we profile a number of different case studies and demonstrate how this comes to pass over the course of 10 to 15 years, excuse me, five to 10 years in certain cases. So. It's, it's very interesting, Margaret, right now. And I've also, I think we saw this years ago when I was in Shanghai, like they also, you also see that on the flip side too. Exactly. You see on, Chi yeah. on the Chinese side, you see more and more engagement from Latin America in China mainland it, it, itself. Um, we're going to end with you, Nicole. Uh, the question about the diaspora. It's an interesting question too, because we always talk about US cultural diplomacy. I was struck, it was maybe about five or six years ago, it was in the Peruvian Foreign Ministry, and there was a uh, Chinese art exhibit on the main floor, uh, which it just kind of shows kind of how the Chinese have been learning about some of the success that the, that the US have had. But uh, to uh, Lee Wan's other question to you about the engagement with the diaspora. I'm just going to ask for permission for a comment to Ambassador Johnson. It's not only about resources, it's also about power, about influence, about um, weakening Taipei that, and, and strengthening their one China policy. I also, a space for economic um, investment. So it's much more about resources, it's more of being a global actor. Um, I think that's the China vision or any other country's vision. We want to be part of the global of diaspora. So. Uh, that's just to complement yeah. the comments. And in the in the, the the Chinese embassy has been very supportive of the Chinese community. Um, the ten percent of the, the population in Panama is Chinese. Um, so when we established relations five years ago, it was um, it was different from the other countries, from El Salvador, from from a, well Honduras now, and from Dominican Republic because the community was so big, and we were so used to the Chinese presence in our country from more than, for more than 160 years. So it was something 
the relationship, the political relationship was opened, but actually the commercial and economic ties were already established so long ago. So yes, there's a support from the Chinese embassy, but um, and actually the decision from, from the former president to establish relations was influenced by a member of the, a very active member of the Chinese community, not me, a very right. Chinese person. <laughs> and uh, so this way we see the influence of the Chinese community in, in, in politics. And uh, though we don't have a politician, a Chinese politician yet. yet. Yeah. But yes. So I'll, I'll say that uh, a number of us on this panel are professors. Margaret, you teach. I teach. Evan, I think. Uh, Jorge. Uh, so I'm an easy grader, and I'll give this panel an A uh, <laughs> as well for answering the question of what are the opportunities and the challenges in this era of strategic competition. I think that over the course of this last hour, we've given a lot to this audience, both here as well as the many people watching virtually on. What are some of those new opportunities as we look to the future phase of China's engagement with the region? But also, what are some of the challenges and what, I think to Hori's points as well, what, what we should be thinking about so far as how to engage with a region that wants to be engaged with maybe a little bit differently uh, than, the, than, than the past. I know there's another question here. We're out of time. I'm sure the panelists will be delighted to stay around and, and take any other, any other questions, but want to also make sure that everybody in the audience can feel free to, uh, uh, to move on with their e evening plans. Uh, I want to again, uh, Leland, I want to thank you. Uh, I want to thank Brian. I want to thank the entire team at, at FIU. Great to co-host this panel. I also do want to give a quick plug. Um, if you're in DC on Thursday, uh, join the join FIU. Join FIU in DC, actually. Join FIU in DC, the Atlantic Council, the, the Embassy of Barbados. We're going to be having a discussion and reception on uh, Beyond the Beaches. So unfortunately, no beaches in Washington. Uh, but uh, Beyond the Beaches, understand the importance of the Caribbean, the global context. And Ambassador Lynch will be there, Das Feinstein, Waz, myself, and, and others. So this is a great week of, of working with FIU. Again, my, uh, please join me in a round of applause uh, for Nicole, Jorge, Margaret, and Evan.